My worst subject in school was science, and at the time, I didn't know why. I did consistently well in all my other subjects, save for math, which I did worse at as high school progressed. My best guess as to why I did poorly is that I was always more of an abstract thinker than a concrete thinker. The world of facts, and what we know for certain, was less interesting to me than the gargantuan depths of the human imagination. This is why, as some of my regular followers can plainly see, I have such a strong interest in subjects like philosophy, psychology, and religion. One topic that I discuss frequently that sort of combines all those subjects together is the elevation of one's consciousness to a level that one might reasonably call divine. Most often, I present depictions of human transcendence as it pertains to popular media, and then I discuss the philosophical and moral ramifications of that transcendence. The biggest limiting factor in this discussion, however, is obviously my lack of scientific knowledge. For a lot of people, the discussion of transcendence is moot if it doesn't have a scientific basis. For a time, I wondered whether or not a piece of popular media existed that had a strong scientific basis for human transcendence. And as always, I have to thank my community for pushing me in the right direction, because I found that piece of media in Parasite Eve. Now some of those who have played Parasite Eve might find my previous statements worrying. After all, the story features a villain who can make people melt using her mind. Am I about to suggest that telekinesis is scientific fact? No, don't worry. But what I will say is that the science Parasite Eve's fiction is built on is, for the most part, factual. This is mostly due to the game and the novel it was based on being written by a real-life pharmacologist named Hideaki Sena. Of the many reasons that people love the Parasite Eve series, this is arguably the primary one. It lends that semi-illusory sense of authenticity to the fiction, the kind that enhances our love for the story in the same way that, say, The Martian does. In fact, it does it so well that I think it's safe to say that no other form of gaming media has surpassed it in this regard since its release back in 1998. In a few minutes, I will investigate some of the science behind Parasite Eve and discriminate between truth and fiction. Then, we will discuss whether the science that is true can actually provide a legitimate pathway to transcendence. But first, I wish to present a brief, spoiler-free synopsis for those who have no knowledge of the first Parasite Eve game. If you're already knowledgeable, please feel free to use the time codes in the description box to skip forward. The first Parasite Eve video game is a sequel to the novel of the same name, although its story is written in a way so that one does not need to read the book whatsoever to be caught up. The story begins on Christmas Eve 1997. You play as Aya Bria, a New York policewoman who is attending the opera at Carnegie Hall. During the opera, everybody in the auditorium, save for Aya and the lead actress, Melissa, begin to spontaneously combust. Aya confronts Melissa. Melissa then hints at the reason why Aya wasn't affected, saying it has something to do with her mitochondria. Melissa runs away to a back room where she is playing piano. Here, the supposed Melissa reveals that her personality has been taken over by an entity named Eve. She then transforms into a levitating, demonic form. Before she escapes into the sewers below, she claims that the day for the mitochondria to be free has finally arrived. From this point on, it is up to Aya to figure out who or what Eve is, the nature of her powers, and why they have no effect on Aya. Now, my initial plan at this point in the video was to give an overview of the game's numerous qualities outside of its scientific basis, mainly for those who have never heard of Parasite Eve until watching this video. But then I thought of a different approach that would make things quicker and more focused. If you want a detailed analysis of things like the game's unique combat system and its unparalleled musical ambiance, 
I will refer you to a video by a fellow YouTuber named The Sphere Hunter. Her opinion in regards to these two subjects are the exact same as mine, and it's presented in a clear and invigorating way. I will leave a link to that video in the description box. One last thing before I go into the focal point of this video. There will be some story spoilers regarding the origin of Eve and her powers. If you have not played Parasite Eve yet, and want to enjoy it spoiler free, you can buy the game on the PlayStation Network on PS3, or you can emulate it. I will leave a tutorial for emulation in the description box. If Parasite Eve were to be summarized in one word, most fans, I imagine, would choose the word mitochondria. Just as the word nanomachines explained every aspect of Metal Gear Solid 4, mitochondria are the foundation for every narrative occurrence in Parasite Eve. Now, I remember almost nothing from when I was taught science, but like most people, I do remember that the mitochondria are the quote-unquote powerhouse of the cell. The mitochondria work in conjunction with the nucleus, which can be roughly understood as the brain of the cell. Together, they regulate all cellular functions. In real life, the mitochondria and the nucleus share a symbiotic relationship. One cannot live without the other. But in Parasite Eve, the mitochondria evolve to the point where it basically renders the nucleus unnecessary. In regards to the Eve character, she is a dormant consciousness residing in Melissa's mitochondria. Granted, the mitochondria that Eve resides in were not originally in Melissa's body, but were given to her when she received a kidney transplant from Aya's sister Maya, whose mother was Mariko, who was given a liver transplant from a character from the novel named Kiyomi, who was the first to house Eve's cells, and yes, I'm a giant nerd, <laughs> as I push up my glasses. Anyways. The Eve consciousness that lies within all of Melissa's mitochondria develop a hive mind that extends throughout her body. This consciousness facilitates the mutation of Melissa's mitochondria so they can act as independent organelles. This allows for the Eve consciousness to take over Melissa's mind and body, evolving it to the point that she can perform godlike feats. Like I said before, Obviously stuff like psychokinesis and telekinesis aren't scientifically valid concepts. That said, the foundation that allows for the creation of the godlike Eve is based in scientific fact. At one point early on in the game, the scientist character, Hans Klomp, says the mitochondria have their own DNA, separate from the human body. This is actually true. Now the reason for this is obviously uncertain, but the most popular theory centers around something known as endosymbiosis. In the simplest terms, scientists believe that around 1.45 billion years ago, mitochondria existed as their own separate entity, maybe specialized bacteria, but then were assimilated into a bigger cell, where they now live in that symbiotic relationship with the nucleus. Now take this fact and combine it with something else that Han says, which is that the mitochondria have a mutation rate that is 10 times higher than the nucleus. That is also true, with some speculating that it's even greater than that. With this said, the question that needs to be answered is as follows. Given the right circumstances, could the separate DNA within the mitochondria combine with the mutation rate to foster a conscious organism within us? Not only that, but one that can transcend the human state, like Eve does? Even though the underlying science about the mitochondria is correct, the idea it can become its own conscious entity is, well, you want to help me out, Mr. Frakes? It's false. No way. No. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. It's fiction. It's fiction. In order for something like Eve to be born, a series of highly specific events would need to occur. First, mitochondria DNA as we understand it now cannot live on its own. Just because it has its own DNA doesn't mean it is sufficient for independence. It needs the nucleus in order to direct its function. As for the mitochondria's tenfold mutation rate, just because it has that capacity doesn't mean that it will mutate to produce a greater being. Its function is directed by the nucleus to support the body, not itself. 
for the mitochondria to evolve on its own, it would need a replacement for the nucleus before it could even think about taking the pre-existing nucleus over. Again, the nucleus is the brain, and the mitochondria are the muscle. Now could a quantum level consciousness originate within the body's mitochondria and direct its genetic mutation to create a godlike being? Maybe, but in regards to Parasite Eve, you would have to accept that the mitochondria consciousness is somehow shielding its development from the human eye. And remember, human consciousness is something that developed over billions of years due to highly specific factors and evolutionary pressure. To believe mitochondria would covertly evolve for its own purposes, while also shielding a dormant consciousness, would be an enormous leap in logic. Before I conclude this video, I want to give attention to the concept of spontaneous combustion. Parasite Eve proposes that the Eve consciousness could activate all of the mitochondria in somebody's body, overheating them to the point that a person could catch on fire. Let's put aside for a second the impossible notion of Eve's consciousness, as well as the idea of setting somebody on fire via telekinesis. I wanted to know whether it would be possible to set a human on fire if, somehow, all of a person's mitochondria activated at once. While I was able to partially answer this question using basic research and logic, I did have to reach out to my community to round things out. From what I understand, though mitochondria produce heat, they do not produce flame, which would require some sort of combustion. Moreover, the mitochondria would not be able to continue the flame, even if it produced it, for two reasons. One, the average human body is roughly 75% water, and that water would disrupt the burning process unless there was a consistent fuel source for the fire, which the body does not have. This is why, when a body is being cremated, it needs to be kept at 1600 degrees Fahrenheit for around 2-3 hours, with a consistent fuel source. The second reason a spontaneous flame couldn't be maintained is because it would not only burn other mitochondria in the body, but the mitochondria's metabolic pathways would be disrupted by the increase in heat, forcing heat production to stop soon after it began. To check my work, I reached out to my audience to see if there were any biology students among them. One viewer, named Talia, said she was a geneticist and microbiologist. She helped me out enormously by not only confirming my research, but adding upon it. According to her, some people believe in mitochondrial spontaneous combustion because an enzyme in the mitochondria uses leftover electrons to cleave oxygen and bind it to hydrogen to create water. And this is considered a form of combustion. This is one of the ways mitochondria creates energy. However, Talia notes that very little heat is actually generated from this combustion. Even if a consciousness tried to use a large quantity of electrons to produce a large amount of heat, the mitochondria would lysis. It would rupture. This is because the enzymes would, quote, pump too many protons into the mitochondrial inner membrane space, which would be far too acidic for ATPase to produce ATP. ATP being the energy-carrying molecules in the cell. So not only would it be impossible for the body to set fire, it would be impossible for Aya or Eve to use their ATP-based magical powers like they do in the game. If, however, the mitochondria somehow were able to generate that kind of heat, what would happen wouldn't be a flame. Rather, the gases within the cells would expand rapidly and that rapid expansion would cause an explosion before all the other liquids in the body could be converted to gases, resulting in something like, to use Talia's words, a gooey mess. While we do see human beings turn into gooey messes in Parasite Eve, they certainly do not explode. All this suggests that unless there was some sort of quantum level consciousness manipulating the structure on the fly, it would not be possible for a godlike being to be produced from human flesh. Despite this, Parasite Eve still deserves to be recognized as the most scientific game ever, because the foundational science is correct. Not just in this regard, but so many others that I didn't have time to address. If I had never played this game, I can't say that I would ever be inclined to read any scientific literature. 
And now that I have, I can safely say that I learned more about biology from playing Parasite Eve than I ever did in school. There are other aspects of Parasite Eve that I wish I could analyze, but due to my limited scientific knowledge and lack of time, I will have to save that for another day. I would be willing to collaborate with people in the future in order to do a full investigation, by the way. Some of you suggested I collaborate with a YouTuber named Roanoke Gaming. Let him know that I would be down for that. Until then, I kindly ask that you guys give this video a like. If you want to see more in-depth investigations like this in the future, please hit that subscribe button. Also, if you want to ensure the continued production of these kinds of videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon or joining my YouTube members section. Joining either of them will reward you with several different perks at affordable prices. I will leave links to those in the description box below. Thanks guys, and until next year, I want to remind you as always and as per usual, stay yellow.